Okay, uh, welcome folks. Uh, today we're gonna be looking at cost validation budgets, or validation cost budgets, I should say, uh, within Cell in Kubernetes and what they mean, and in particular, why, may, why they might error and how to avoid that. So, what we're gonna look at today. We'll start off by taking a look at what Cell is and working out why we might actually want to use that feature. Uh, we'll talk about what and why we have these validation cost budgets. We'll start looking at the rule cost and cardinality, two elements of the total cost. And then we'll finish up by making sure that we all understand how to avoid high cost validations, uh, high validation costs in our CRDs. Uh, before we go too far though, I'm Joel. Uh, I'm a principal software engineer at Red Hat. I focus primarily on cloud technology, CCMs and CAPI, uh, but I'm also one of our OpenShift API review team and last year contributed a library as part of the Cell project upstream. So, what is Cell? Well, it's this thing called the Common Expression Language and it came out of Google. The idea was to create something simple that would be able to be used for kind of common expressions uh, that could then be embedded into other projects. So the idea was that it would be C-like, non-Turing complete deliberately so that it's not too complex, lightweight, fast execution, and ideally extensible, meaning that not only do you have the built-in syntax of the language, but we can start adding new functions on top of the language to make it more usable in specific use cases. The bottom box here, the sort of dark box with the green text, is an example of a cell expression. Account and transaction are objects, they have fields within them, we've got operators that you'll probably recognize, and this condition evaluates to a Boolean, true or false. Now, this started being used in Cube for CRD validation, so ex-Kubernetes validations, we brought that in GA in 129. And that, the idea here was basically to make CRDs more self-contained and, and easier to develop. The idea is that we can bring complex validation into the CRD schema, have it execute within the API server, and get rid of webhooks. Uh, an example of this is this immutable field schema. This is quite common uh, across APIs where you have some data and you don't want it to be changed. With cell, all I have to do is write self equals old self, and that's solved for me. That data can no longer be changed once it's set in that API. It's also used in other places, uh, one of which is validating admission policy. Um, I'll touch on this one briefly, but I'm not going to go too much detail. This was feature was GA in 130, and it's kind of like the same validations, but you can apply it to anything. Apply it to a built-in type, apply it to a CRD that you don't own the schema of. You can kind of write whatever you want there, and it's slightly more powerful. The example here actually is something from production that, uh, that we use in OpenShift. Um, it's to prevent something called trampoline pods, and if you want to know what those are, there was a talk yesterday by Joe and David. Go look at it. Um, but the idea here is we have two expressions, and if both expressions evaluate to true, then the request is allowed. The top one here is actually looking into the request metadata. So when a pod uses a service account token, it gets extra information added to it. Part of that is the node name that it's running on. We check that that is, exists so that we know that the request came from a pod with a bound service token. Then the second line here checks that the object we're updating matches that node name. So the idea here is that we have a daemon set and we make sure that it can only update the node it's running on. A really nice and powerful use case to prevent kind of security leaks. You don't want your daemon set on one node updating the node that it's not on. Very similar to how Kubelet's node admission works. So, what else can it do? Well, there's loads of stuff. Uh, we can validate the dependencies between fields. If you've ever heard of a discriminated union where you have one field that tells you which type or which member of the rest of the struct can be allowed, we can validate that using a ternary. If you wanted to validate that your field has a URL in it and that that URL is secure, you can do that too. As of Cube 131, we have the ability to validate IP addresses directly in the, IP, in the CRD schema. And in this case, we can check that the families are distinct. This validation will give us for a list of two IP addresses whether one is IPv4 and one is IPv6. We can make sure lists are additive, and if we have a field that looks like uh, a size, maybe it's memory or uh, storage, we could also check there's a minimum with an easy validation. Okay, so this sounds great, right? Let's do this everywhere. Well, yes, the more validation you can put into your CRD schema, the better. It means fewer webhooks. But as with all good things, there is a catch. The validations are not free. All of these validations run in the API server in tree. So whenever you send a create or an update for your custom resource, it has to run these validations and that costs CPU cycles. When you've got one request, that's probably not gonna be too bad. But I don't think anyone's API server is serving one request at a time. So 
to prevent the API server from being overwhelmed, Cell, and in particular the implementation within the API server, uses what we call resource constraints. And it does this in two ways. So one is estimated cost. When you create your CRD or update it, you have the schema within that resource. It iterates through the schema, looks at all of the rules you've provided, and works out what is the worst case of this runtime validation cost. By doing that and comparing it to a fixed uh, budget, it can say ahead of time when you're installing the CRD, no, I think this is too expensive. Then, as a backup, there's also runtime cost. Uh, and this is actually what happens for validating emission policy. Uh, but when you are updating the custom resource, again, it will look at the input that it has, check the cost, and if the cost is going to be too high, it will prevent that API request from going through. All in the kind of effort to stop the API server being overwhelmed. So, has anyone ever seen an error message like this before? This is a genuine error message that I got while I was reviewing someone's API. They wanted to put this regex in and match against it. But the API server came back and said, you've exceeded your budget by 100 times. How does it even come to that number? Well, that's what we're going to find out. So before we get too deep, there's two big numbers I need to introduce you to, 10 million and 100 million. Each rule that you have in your CRD schema will be validated against a per rule limit of 10 million cost units. If you have lots and lots of small rules, that's fine. But if the total sum of all of those rule costs exceeds 100 million, then your CRD is still too complex, and the CRD in total will also be rejected. So 10 million is an important number. We're going to focus on that one. We need to keep out all of our budget underneath 10 million. There are two factors that we compare against this budget. Rule cost and cardinality. Rule cost is, let's take this rule, let's execute it once. What is that going to cost? And cardinality is, well, how many times are we going to run this rule? Not every field exists in a schema only once, and therefore it's possible with certain custom resources, certain fields, that we'll need to execute the validation multiple times. So let's break down a little bit of a cell rule. If we take a look at the top line here, this is relatively straightforward. We have some objects, we have some operators. We've got conditional, logical, and. All of these things are fixed costs. So we can work out the cost of this line, 10 cost units. On the second line, we start introducing functions. Now, some functions are pretty straightforward. Taking the size of a list, for example, again, has a fixed cost. So this line is also a relatively easy one to work out, nine cost units. But what happens when you take a look at that third example? Now we have an input. We have a string that we're taking. And that string could vary in length. This is where things start to get more complicated. If we take this example, uh, we're going to look at what we call proportional cost. So things like contains or matches, starts with, ends with, all of these are calculated based on the length of their input. So in this example, we have a string there, self. Uh, I don't know if that's a valid URL. I just kind of made it up. And we're going to match it against the regex on the second line. Uh, if you don't recognize this regex, it's DNS1123 subdomain. It's used across cube for object meta name and all sorts of things. And we're going to work out the cost of this. To do that, we take the length of the input. Uh, we times that by the string traversal cost factor, take the ceiling of that, mul that, multiply that all then by the ceiling of the length of the regex times the regex traversal cost factor. In that case, we can get the formula on the bottom. The string traversal cost factor is 0.1. Regex traversal is 0.25. And so with this input and this rule, we have a cost of 113. We can also look at lists. So while I said it's non-Turing complete and we don't have for loops, we do have some macros that iterate. So all exists, exists one, uh, can iterate over arrays in your API. So in this case, you can approximate the cost uh, of this by taking the length of the list, working out the per step cost. So in this case, what does x matches cost for us? Then there's some additional cost for each step of the loop, the and, the assignment of variables and then the cost of the arguments as well. So for this particular example, we can get 318. And you might be sat there thinking, well, 10 million is a big number. Joel, we're nowhere near this. Well, yes, we aren't there yet. But what happens at CRD admission? Well, we don't actually have real data to work with. What we have is a schema and an unknown amount of data. So this is where the API server has to work out what is the worst case. We don't know the length of the strings in this list, and we don't know how long the list is. I can't complete this formula. 
So if we look at the string case, this time we have that string. We don't know what it is. We've got one thing missing in our formula. What is the length of that string? The API server will look at the schema, and it will say, OK, well, the max length is 256. Now, an important thing to note here, if you look at this formula, it's slightly different to before. There's a times four there. Uh, something I learned recently, open API schemas use runes for their max length. And if you convert a rune into a byte, the worst case is four bytes per rune. So to work out the accurate cost in the worst case, we have to multiply that length by four. So again, we can plug this in, a max length of 256 with that regex, and we end up at 2,885 cost units. Starting to creep up. But what happens when you don't have a length? I'm going to wager that most of us in this room at some point have written a CRD and forgotten to put a max length on that string field. Well, that's where, again, the API server has to work out the worst case. So what it does is assume that your entire request is that field. So the maximum request size is three megabytes. Uh, a string has to be in quoted uh, to be valid JSON. So we take three megabytes, we take the two off, and that is our worst case in bytes. That would be equivalent to roughly 790,000 characters in the, in the schema. So when we plug that in, suddenly we're at cost of 8.8 .8 million cost units, 88% of our budget just on that one rule. Now, going back to the list. So this time, we've taken that same rule. We've got the X matches with the same validation we had before. The items, again, have a max length of 256. So the step cost here we know from the previous slide, 2885. But again, we don't know the length of this list. Well, that's where it looks at max items. So if you've put max items 1024, 1024 times the rest of that formula, and we work out about 3 million cost units. So that's fairly straightforward. You may be predicting where this is going. But what if we don't know? So again, we have to work out what is the worst case length of this list. And for that, we have to work out how many items could we possibly have in the list if this was the only field in the API. And to do that, we need to know the minimum size of the item in the list. So in this case, we've got a string list. Minimum size of a string is the empty string. It's a pair of quotes. So we can take the formula, uh, three megabytes minus the two for the ends of the array, uh, over min size plus one, and you get just over a million items in this list. Now that number, three billion, is 300 times my cost budget. That's why it said 100 times earlier. It's very easy if you forget to add max items to end up way, way over budget. Now, not every list is built equal. Not every list is a list of strings. In fact, here's an example of a list where you have a key and a value, and both of those are required fields. Now for objects, the way to calculate the minimum size is slightly different. What you need to do is take the minimum size of a JSON object, which is an empty pair of braces, and then add the size of each required field. So in this case, we have key and value. We take the length of the name, the minimum serialized size of the thing within it, be that an object or a string. Again, this could be recursive. And then plus four for the quotes, the colon, and the comma. And you can work out the, min the minimum size of this object. So this is 22. If we go back then to working out what the worst case is on this, we plug that back into the formula we had before, and we're down to 395 million cost units, still nearly 40 times over budget. But only 137,000 items this time, not the 1 million we had in the previous example. So you might also be thinking, well, these rules are the same, right? You've, you've done the same thing. You've self all with the same regex. Well, why don't we just move that back down into the items? So in this case, we know the cost of that. Right? The max length is 256. We've seen this example. 2885 is our cost. Well, that's pretty clever. And in fairness, I would totally do that. Bring the validation down as low as you can. But now we need to talk about what cardinality is. So audience participation point. If this rule is part of the schema, how many times do we think this rule is going to execute on the worst case? OK, once. You can only have this field in the schema once. Uh, the Open API v3 schema at the top is like, this is the entire schema that we have. If we move on to a list, again, we have this rule here in the list, acting on the list. Anyone want to guess? It's not a 1,000. It's only once. We're operating on the list itself, 
but if I come back to you on the next one, what do you think this one is? This time it's 1,000, exactly. And that's why that previous example wouldn't work, right? We have to take the rule that's in the items and multiply it by the number of items that could be in the list. So it would have been whatever the size of that list was times the 2885. Now what's the cardinality? So again, we don't know. There's no max items. So again, the API server has to fall back to what is the worst case. Now this time, and I don't actually know why this is, there's a different formula used. And because this all has to be stable, otherwise it's a breaking change, this will never change. Cube is stuck with this inconsistency. This time, to work out the, we call this unbounded cardinality, the maximum number of times we could possibly execute this, we do the three megabytes over min size plus one, we are missing the minus two off that top, uh, off the denominator. So again, it makes very negligible difference. We're still at three billion cost units, we're still 300 times over. Now, when I saw this, that got me thinking. Which of these do we prefer? Anyone, anyone prefer left? Anyone prefer right? Well, I prefer the left. It is ever so slightly cheaper. Um, it's 0.1% cheaper for some reason. Uh, I say some reason. On the right-hand side, by doing self.all, we're actually including the cost of that iteration within the cost analysis. But on the left-hand side, the iteration and going over the loop is outside of cell and therefore isn't calculated into the cost. Again, I don't know why there's this minor discrepancy. I haven't talked to API machinery about it but there is a slight difference. That also got me wondering, well, what happens then if we wanted to go the other way? Is there a time where the right-hand side is better? So I put together some silly maths and tried to work this out, and I worked out that if we have y equals 3x, the rule cost is three times calculated cardinality, then they would be equilibrium. And if we went further, then the right-hand side would be the cheaper option. But to do this, the rule cost would either have to be incredibly high, or the calculated cardinality would have to be incredibly low. And to get that, you'd have to have a massive, massive object with lots of required fields. I also then worked out that actually this is a rounding error anyway, and unless you happen to have an exactly uh, factor of three megabytes as your minimum serialized size, this formula falls apart and you end up with y equals zero, so it doesn't work. Now, as I mentioned earlier, some of you have probably sat there thinking, oh, well, my API doesn't have any limits. So what does it mean then that I can do? Well, if we take the unbounded array of strings option, and we know that the limit is 10,000, and we refactor the uh, formula and work backwards, we can work out if you do have an unbounded array of strings, you can afford nine units on your validation. Any more than that, and you blow the budget. For the regex, again, if we rearrange that, you could have 127 characters in your regex, but no more. And that's, yep, I do need to start wrapping up. Uh, so. Looking at what we've touched on so far today, primarily it's been focusing on that matches function, and that's what, because it's one of the more complicated ones. But there are lots of different functions, and they all have different formulas for how they're calculated. Lots of the functions where you're just looking at a string and parsing it, checking if it's a valid URL or a quantity, the cost of that is just proportional to the input string. There's nothing more complicated. Size of the input times the traversal factor. Where you're doing allocations as well, split, join, and replace, that's estimated as double the size. We've got the matches and find all that we've already explored. Accessing properties is constant. We've looked at the uh, array iteration. And then there's some interesting sort of side notes. So some things in the cell cost analysis are slightly more clever than you might think. When you parse an IP address, you're not parsing it into a string, you're parsing it into a list of bytes. And so in the worst case, that's an IPv6 address, so it'd be 16 bytes. So the cost of comparing two IPv6 addresses is 32 times the string traversal cost factor, not 39 times two times the string traversal cost factor, which is what it would be as a string. So there are a few of those special cases in there. There's links to how this is all implemented at the bottom of the slide if you wanna go and look at it. Um, and then also, just to recap, some of those things you might wanna have in, in your mind when you're writing your validations. The worst case for the string, just over three million. We should probably shrink that if we want to. Uh, working out the worst case length of the array and the unbounded cardinality are all useful things to know. Now, as promised, what do we need to know to avoid blowing the budget? Well, I suggest you make friends with these two markers. So, cube builder validation max length and max items. 
every string that you have in your schema, unless it has a particular format, say enum or date time, needs to have a maximum length. Every array that you have should also have a maximum length. And I say this even if you're not currently using cell. If you've written a CRD and you've got an array and later you want to add a new field that's optional within that array, and you haven't got an unbound, if you haven't got a bound on the length of your array, you're gonna find it very difficult to add cell validations in. So make sure that you, even when you're not using cell, add those limits, think about the use case, think about something sensible, make sure you've got enough headroom. Um, for a concrete example of this, in the cluster API community, we recently are refactoring the way that conditions work. We know that we have eight or nine conditions on resources. We set the length limit to 32. It gives us plenty of headroom for expansion in the future. And even if you do need to expand that in the future, relaxing a validation is easier as a breaking change than restricting. And just kind of in case you really can't work it out, in all of my time doing API reviews since I've been using Cell, I've never seen anyone need more than 256 items in a list, and I've never seen anyone need more than 4,096 items in a, in a string. Uh, but yeah, think about your use case. And then just before I go, Think about checking your work. So there's two ways that we do this. Um, so one is using integration tests. If you're not familiar with the env test project, I thoroughly recommend it. Uh, it's part of Kube Builder and Controller Runtime. It spins up a temporary API server. We'll install the CRDs and check all of this for you. And then the second project is something that currently exists within OpenShift, but we're working to upstream this with SIG API machinery. The idea behind this checker is it takes the CRD schema, compares it to the old one, and finds breaking changes but it's also being used as a bit of a linter and can be used in CI to kind of lint your schemas. Now, recently we added cell cost validation to this, and in fact, earlier this week, we merged some stuff into this to explain the validations. So things like finding your unbounded lists, working out what the cardinality is and working out the rule cost, this will all get printed out so you can kind of inspect that and understand that better as part of your CI run. And that's all I have for today. So if you have any feedback, there's QR codes there. And if you have any questions, there's a couple of microphones either side, which I'm hoping should be switched on shortly. Thank you very much. I assume the budgets are hard-coded. Are there any plans to make it configurable in the future, or would that just totally upset the formula in terms of the formula seems kind of aligned to the budget? Uh, so the budgets could be configured. In theory, you could patch it, but as far as I'm aware, SIG API machinery would probably consider that a breaking change. Bear in mind, like if it was restricted, anything that exists today would suddenly start failing the validation. And if it was relaxed, in theory, anyone who, anyone who was already running, it could start consuming more CPU than it was. So I expect that budget will never change. If there's no other questions, then we can wrap. Thank you all.